just want to take a deep breath this morning. Just like the song says, we are standing on holy ground. In our country, in our neighborhood, in our cities, we see all the trouble, all the sinless shooting around this globe. Church, we are in different times now. And it's good to know that you can come to a place to worship your God. And to know that you have security in knowing that God is still in the blessing business. Yes, he sees the sinless shooting. Yes, he sees the awfulness that's in this country and yet God, that doesn't surprise God. He warned us that this would happen, didn't he? He said we would have days like this. So as Christians, we don't have to respond to, as if there's no God. God knows and sees what's going on. We're standing also because this is our call to worship. And as we continue in our call to worship, we would be reminded that this is a time of prayer and praise to our Father. The scripture we choose to teach in this call to worship is James 4, 7 teaches us to submit ourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift our hands in humble submission to your will. We resist the devil, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you will cause Jesus to magnify himself in our midst.
we stand now for our intercessory prayer. I'm just believing God. Is there anybody out there in that same mindset? I'm just believing God. Yes, there's things that happen that I cannot understand. The situations that is going on in my life, I cannot make any sense out of it. There's people on my job. There's people in my family that are sick. There's people all over this world have lost loved ones, and it's it's I, I, I can't understand it. My baby sister had three heart attacks this year. Can't understand it. But I believe in God. I just believe. And there's times in our life we got to come to that conclusion. I know what's happening. I just choose to believe. I can't make sense out of it. I can't connect the dots. So I believe. Believe in God. I believe in his word. I believe in his faithfulness. I believe in his promises. I believe in his blessings. I believe in his healing. I believe in his deliverance. I believe in his love. I believe in his truth. I believe in his sovereignty. Today, I pray that you will have that mindset as we go into our intercessory prayer. And on our list today, we want to continue to lift up our brother Foster Allen, Deacon Walter and Desiree Allen, Sister Jessica Austin, Brother Samuel Ballinger, Sister Alberta Bowen, Brother Terrence Brooks, Sister Carolyn and D. Andre, Andre Campbell, Brother Herbert and Sister Blondina Caswell, Cheryl Cox, Pastor Richard Curry, and his brother David Curry, Sister Teresa Curry, and family. Good to see you, Sister Curry. Sister Patricia Fairbanks and Mother Thelma Flingner Free. Brother Herbert Fitzpatrick, Sister Otho Fraser. Brother Otis Glover, Brother Ivory Godwin, Sister Michelle Grooms, Brother Leonard and Sister Tammy Hackley, the Hill family, Vanella Jackson, the jail ministry, Sister Dorothy Johnson, Brother Adrian and Stanley Limbrick, Sister Phyllis Luckett, Sister Daphne Mitchell, Sister Heidi Myers, Sister Patrice Porter, Brother Bentley Porter, Lawrence Rahim, Sister Brenda Sapp, Brother Earl and Sister Pat Shell, Deacon Ralph Smith and family, Brother Richard and Easter Sneed. Controller Stringfield. Controller Stings Stringfield. Daryl Stringfield Jr. Shalithia Stringfield. The Stringfield family. Brother Mitchell Sutton. Sister Gwendolyn Thomas. Brother Tucker Jr. and Sr. Sister Hattie Wallace, Brother Quentin Wallace, Sister James Edel Wallace, the Wallace family. When they are willing, our Father, it is with thanksgiving in our hearts and praises on our tongue as we come to your throne of grace. We 
come with thanksgiving, Lord. We come asking God that you will forgive us for our confessed sin. We come asking God that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord God, we recognize your, your holiness. We ask God that you will have mercy upon us. God, we come confused about what is happening around us in our city, in our homes, and even in our lives. We don't know the answer, Lord. We struggle to trying to figure things out. We have no idea what tomorrow will bring. So, Lord, we look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, Lord, you created us in your image and in your likeness. Therefore, Lord, we come to you because we know no other person to come to. We found reference in you. We found peace in you, Lord. We found security in you, Lord. We found love in you, O Lord. We found healing in you, O Lord. We found deliverance in you, O Lord. And, O Lord, according to your righteousness, have mercy upon us, O Lord. Help us, Lord, to love one another, treat one another the way you taught us to treat one another. And yes, Lord, we lift this prayer list before you. You know about them already. Even if we mispronounce the names, Lord, you say in your word, you know the hairs that is on their head. So, Lord, we look into you, oh, Lord, to do your perfect work in, in, in each of their lives. Thank you, Father, for giving us the privilege to come to your throne. Thank you, Father, for inclining your ear to our supplications. Thank you, Lord, for looking beyond our faults and meeting our every need. Thank you, Lord, for healing us. Thank you, Lord, for delivering us. Thank you, Lord. For your love and your mercy, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving me better than I love myself. Thank you, Lord, for being my rescue. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your, for your restoration. Oh, bless this holy name. Lord, we just choose to believe today, Lord. We believe today, Lord. We trust your name today, Lord. We trust your word, Lord. We trust your way, Lord. Have mercy, O oh Lord. And Lord, when it all said and done, when it all said and done, you and you alone, God, will get the glory. You and you alone will get the praise, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Have your way today in this place, oh Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Glory to your name, oh Lord. Have your way today, oh Lord. We learned today when the Holy Ghost filled you and we are all on one accord. Oh God, we look for miraculous to come into our lives today because you are faithful. Yes, you are faithful, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We trust you, Lord. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I pray that's your testimony. This is my story and this is my song. And I pray that you have a song that you can sing all through the day. I can tell you those songs do help me. When I go to my production meeting on my job as a logistic manager, you hear the noise say, well, where's my parts? Where's this? Why we can't get this on time? And you got to be praying all day long because those production meetings can get, it can get kind of rough. <laughs> those that are in logistics will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> all right, I stand now for the reading of our scriptures. Turn with me. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, we've been instructed to read verses 17 through verse 26. Again, that is First Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 17 through verse 26. <clears throat> and when you have it, Will you signify by saying amen? amen? Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there is division among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also hearsay, heresy among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received unto the Lord, for I have received un, I have received of the Lord, that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, which he has supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. I have read to you God's living word. The flower fadeth, the grass withereth, but the word of God shall stand forever.
shout for that because he could have come down at any moment to save himself but he didn't do it in his heart he saw every single one of us and the Bible teaches us that in his heart when he died he died with each one of us on his mind what a blessing that is. And he stayed there because he saw the sins of E.C. and said, that in itself is enough for me to die for. But he didn't stop there. He looked and saw throughout the whole world and 
saw the need of mankind, and he loved mankind so much, even the sinners. You know, it would be enough to say that, well, he's a good God because um, he loved his children. That, that, that would be, you know, I mean, that's almost conceivable. But the Bible tells us that he loved the whole world, even the worst sinners, the most diabolical, psychological, messed up people. He loved so much that he died for them, knowing that they would even reject him. He didn't care because his love was unconditional. And that's the love that he is bound to teach us in this day and time, that agape love, a love that, that has no conditions whatsoever, a, de, a, a determined will in our own hearts to love one another the way God says so. A will to do it with no emotion, with, with no conditions, I love you because God says that I should love you and I'm loving you with the strength that he gives me in my heart because he's alive in me, a determined will. And it's so wonderful that he decided not to come down off of that cross. He decided to be right there, stay right there to show us how much he loved us. And I thank God for that. Thank him for it, and I bless his holy name. Father, thank you for what you did for us. Thank you, God, that you chose not to come off of that cross because you saw our need, knowing that if you did, that mankind would still be destined for hell with no hope. But you did not want that. You determined that that would not happen. So you gave your own life to demonstrate to us how much you loved us. Thank you for that. Thank you for that love. And now, Father, we come to this point of, of teaching and presenting your word. We pray, first of all, that you would forgive me of my sins and cleanse me as your vessel that you would indeed speak through me to your people. Bless us as we hear what you have to say from your word today. We believe the Bible. We believe what you say in the Bible that God has made for us. When our eyes open, it's a miracle that, hey, we're still here. You know, it's just a, a blessing because as you close your eyes, you don't remember when you go to sleep. You don't. And God is watching that until he opens our eyes in the morning. And he's there saying, good morning, beloved. I love you. Now it's time to get up and, and face the day that I have made just for you. Because I've given you the strength to go through this day. You don't have to worry about doing it under your own power. Because we're too weak. We're too frail. We don't see the things that are in front of us that are evil that's there to trip us, but he does. And because we are his children, he perfects the way so that as we walk, it will not harm us nor destroy us. That's the faith, the trust that he wants us to put in him, that he will take care of it. He will do it with the same belief that we believe that he has saved us from damnation that he has saved us from the fires of hell should be the same belief and trust in your heart that he's got today taken care of for you. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. That's gone. All you can do is learn from it. And, and, and don't get anxious about, did I say tomorrow? I meant yesterday. Yeah, yesterday is past. Tomorrow ain't past yet. In his mind it is, in the mind of God, but in ours, it ain't there yet. But in the past, you know, we can only learn from it. And not tomorrow, because first of all, it's not promised, but even still, you won't find him there, according to the scripture. The Bible tells us we will only find him in this moment. 
We won't find him in the next moment. He's only in this moment perpetually. He's always in this moment. And so he says, if you would settle out your life, just, 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 just go into your secret closet, just calm your heart down, and just focus your mind on me. That's where you'll find me in this very moment. And brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm here to tell you that if you learn to pray and to be with him and to meditate with him like that, you will have such a blessing because that's where you'll find him. Speaking to you, loving you, giving you a spirit that is so calm and so beautiful until you cannot describe it. But when you start to be anxious about what's going to happen this afternoon or what's going to happen after we leave church, anxiety jumps in and you cannot sense him because he's not in the midst of all of that. He's not there. He's in this moment. From our lesson today, it is a blessing that he is returning our thoughts to what he has left for us. There's only two ordinances that he's left for us. Holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. And, and again, we have been taught not to confuse the Lord's Supper with the Passover dinner. They're two different things all together. As a matter of fact, just to review just a little bit, for the Passover dinner, he let the devil enjoy it with him. Judas was right there. But when he got ready to introduce the Lord's Supper, he told the devil to go do what you must do. Get out of there. And so he celebrated with the 11 disciples who were with him. And that's what he shares with us today, is that the Lord's Supper is a moment of communion that's between his children with us and him. Not the devil, not the lost. The lost can, cannot receive anything from, from this. It is only for believers, only for those who are born again. Because what he is communing with is with himself who lives within you spiritually. That's what he's communing with. He is looking at himself in each one of us. And then what he is saying to us and knowing that, recognize that's what I'm doing and you can enjoy that moment with us. So in that way, you're communing with me. From the scripture, Verses 24, 25. For when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, take this bread, eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped or finished eating dinner, finished the Passover, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This you do, and as often as you drink it, you show your faith your trust and your belief in me. That's what the scripture says to us even today. For a short moment, I want to talk to you about just simply the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Now, in, in the scriptures, in the scriptures, Paul was admonishing the church. Because what they were doing, they were coming to the Lord's Supper. They were coming to the, to the celebration of the Lord and, and they were coming with a mixed heart. They, all they really saw right up front is the Lord saying, come to my table. So they saw a big dinner. And what the early church was doing, they were coming and they were really having a big feast. I mean, they really, when they said the Lord's table, Lord's Supper, they, hey, they were bringing pot roast, baked turkey, all kinds of stuff, you know, just feasting out. Wine, you know, 
they took the cup that, that, that God was talking about, I mean, uh, wine, full-fledged wine, and they were eating it and getting drunk and, I mean, just carrying this thing overboard. And the poor people that couldn't afford this lavish food and, and all of this wine, they would look and they would yearn for it and lust for it because they didn't have it. So here, those that could afford it was at the table just eating and eating and getting full and drunk and everything else. And the poor folks that was in the congregation couldn't even eat a biscuit. And so Paul was upset about that. And he says, you got this thing all messed up, people. You, you, you don't see what the Lord was leaving for you. He was really talking to you in recognizing what he did for you in the way of his sacrifice. Not full stomachs or drunkenness, but his sacrifice. The idea of the bread being his body that would be tortured and, and torn apart and, and, and given to, 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 to the world to, to be destroyed in your place. And, and his blood that would be shed on Calvary under a new covenant that he was making with you is what he was trying to, to show you. And Paul said, you're missing it all together. He says, don't you have houses to go to to get drunk? He didn't admonish them about getting drunk. Get drunk all you want to. And that's the same thing I tell people today. God ain't telling you not to drink or whatever. You know, I know the Baptist faith said no alcohol and, and bless the Baptist doctrine. Uh, and I'm not beating that up, but I'm talking about the Bible. So Paul told him, don't you have homes to go to and get drunk? Don't you have homes you can go to and eat like this? He says, when you come to the Lord's table, you're coming with the idea to refresh your memory of what Jesus did in your stead. He didn't do this just for himself because he had no sin to atone. He didn't go to the cross because uh, he's your representative and 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 uh, he got sin, so he needs to to uh, take care of that sin to show you what. No, no, no. He had no sin. The man was sinless, but what he did, he took our sins and placed it upon himself, or rather, the Father, God Almighty, who is the Lord Jesus took the penalty, took the sins that we have and placed it upon him. So as he went to Calvary, there was sin that was upon him, but not in him because he was sinless. And so he was trying to, to tell the, the, the Christian congregation that the whole idea of the Lord's Supper is for you to remember what he did in your place because it should have been you. Just, just point blank, it should have been you. The penalty of sin is for your destruction, not, not for his. He's God Almighty without sin. But he loved us so much. He loved you so much until he said, I will take the penalty. See, and, and the one thing that, here, here's, here's what we don't understand in the intensity of, 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 of the of the pain and the suffering that he went through. One sin, the payment, is eternal punishment and damnation in hell for eternity. One sin from one human being. He took upon himself all of the sins of everybody in the world, all of the sins, and placed it upon himself and paid the penalty in three days. You, you all don't see it. <laughs> the penalty of one sin for one person is an agony without you can't describe that's for eternity, that has no end. But being God, God can see beyond all of that. And he took the full penalty and intensity of that sin in three days. Only God could have stood up to the intensity of that pain. Only God could. 
and he did it for us with each one of us individually in his mind yes he did it for the group of believers and unbelievers he did it for the whole world he didn't do it just for the believers he did it for the whole world for everybody but even at that he did it with individually you on his mind even though you weren't even born yet and those that are coming later on that's not even born yet being God he already knew them and he knew the, the, the sins that they would be he knew all of that and he took all of that and he put it upon himself put it upon himself and he suffered it and took care of it because if he had left any sin of anyone uncovered then God in his holiness could not have been holy in raising his son from the dead. The sign to the world, to be specific, the sign to the Jews was his resurrection to prove that he had taken care of the sins of this world. And we should rejoice in that Sometimes we start to think in our mind, there are sins that I know God has overlooked uh, in my life. There's some stuff I done done that I know that God don't know about yet. I mean, th there's a thing, Satan puts that in our minds, or his imps do. And sometimes we think, you know, he don't know that yet. You know, I mean, I hope he don't find it out, you know. That's why I'm trying to live this good life so he don't figure it out and so forth. But he does, and he did, and he took care of it. And you've got no business having any anxiety over it or any worry over it. He knows it, and he's kept it secret. That's why you think he don't know it. That's the God we, we, we serve. That's the God that we serve. Three things that we're going to talk about today. Three things. His sovereignty our unity and our purity his sovereignty our unity among ourselves and the purity that is required in coming to the table first of all we talk about his sovereignty his sovereignty means that his power he is sovereign over the world. He is, he is powerful over everything. There is absolutely nothing or no one or no creature in this universe that has equal power or more power than God. And the only reason that they have any power to do anything they do is because God gives it to them. And then he permits them to use it at his direction and, and, and by his discretion. His sovereignty is without question. Although sometimes we question it. We do. Sometimes we look at God. We probably don't say it, brothers and sisters, but it's in our mind. Lord, are you really in control of this? My life is so raggedy. The more I pray, the worse things get. Yeah, where are you? I'm praying for my, my health, but my health is deteriorating more and more. Where are you? Is your sovereignty really sovereign? Are you really with power? But God tells us that his purpose is beyond our understanding. Because we are his children, the end result is greater than you could ever imagine that your mind want him to carry you through. Why would he, and I know this is cold-blooded saying, but in the mind of God, why would he allow you to suffer in a raggedy body on this earth when he can bring you home in his arms? God's sovereignty has a purpose for everything that happens in our lives. You are not outside of his sovereignty. The Lord's Supper reveals his authority and his power because in that is where we see he overcame the world. When Satan was thinking that he, when he destroyed Jesus, that he would destroy everything else. But here's the thing. Yes, 
the nails and all killed Jesus, but it didn't kill Christ. Get a grip on that. He didn't kill the Christ. The man, the man, yes, he gave his life. Even the world didn't take it. That's why Satan was rejoicing, thinking that he had won out. But Christ, who is divine and ever living and his life itself, was still functioning. He was in the, in the grave, in, in, in the midst of hell, reconciling things back to the Father. Things that, that Adam had given up to Satan. Satan had control of this world up until the, until the resurrection. But Christ was in the pit of hell, grabbing everything back. He didn't ask permission. He didn't know, go and say, Satan, let me have it back. Is it okay if I can? He didn't go there with that humble spirit or whatever. He went there with a victorious stand on, I have overcome everything that you placed to destroy me. And now I'm victorious because I'm here, first of all, to show those that are in hell because the Bible says that where Abraham's bosom was, across the gulf was hell. What was, was the holding place, the place of torment. And he showed them, I am the Christ that the prophets preached about, that you kill the prophets for preaching about me. I am he. Get a good look. And then for those that were in Abraham's bosom, he comforted them and saying, okay, guys, the man that you were preaching about, the Messiah that you were prophesying, the prophet that would come, I am he. And then when he was finished reconciling everything, the Bible said he grabbed them all up and took them back to where he was. We call it heaven. Some people call it paradise. You know, wh whatever Jesus is is where you want to be, whatever the name is. And then the Bible said then hell was enlarged because God already knew that all this foolishness would still go on. But his sovereignty overcome the victory of the grave, overcame in the victory of hell, overcame everything that Satan had planned, and his sovereignty is still in place today. His sovereignty is, is his presence in each one of us. Do you not know that the Bible says that each one of us contain or have the fullness of the Godhead alive in each one of us. That God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is alive in each one of us. And he says, I will never leave you nor will I ever forsake you. He will always be in us. Will always be. Always be. Until we get to a place in glory to where we are in his presence and we are glorified in our, in our heavenly body, our glorified body, in our eternal existence, in our, our incorruptible state. We can be assured, even while we are alive right now, sitting here, that there's nothing that can ever, ever destroy me. He says, don't be afraid of death because death is just a second to where you go from this life into my presence. You, you, you will never be outside of the knowledge of my presence. His sovereignty is his presence in us right now. So no matter what the, the stuff that you see that's coming toward you day by day, God has control over it. God is directing it. God is keeping it in its place. It will never be there to destroy you. So he says, trust me. It's, 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 it's no need for both of us to be worrying. God said, I'm not worrying because I got victory over it. And you're worrying over something that I've already taken care of. You just haven't seen it manifest right now because your trust isn't strong enough to recognize it. God says, your presence makes it known that my sovereignty is still in action because Satan hasn't destroyed you and will not be able to do that. 
unity. God wants unity. It is great in our Sunday school, our church school lesson this morning, talking about on one accord, the, the Holy Spirit. That's what he's, with the Holy Spirit living within us, we are filled with him already. If we are born again, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, spiritually, we all on one accord. Because our thought and our mind in a spiritual uh, place is guided by the Holy Spirit. We just have to recognize it and start to enjoying it and allowing it to speak for us. Everywhere in the Bible where we see unity and one accord, miraculous things happen. Miraculous things happen. The Lord's Supper reflects the unity of the Spirit, the communion of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and us. Because we are now included in the Godhead. We now are blessed in a state that the old time prophets wished for, but they could only enjoy it when, the, when God had need for them because then only the Holy Spirit would come and rest upon them to strengthen them to do what they needed to do, even the disciples before Pentecost. But it, he never came to indwell them, but he does with us, brothers and sisters. We does, we, he does with us. And, and, and sometimes the reason why we can't sense it is because we veil him. In other words, we don't trust him or we don't know enough about him to open our hearts to let him take control of our life. He wants so much to do that for us. That's why he tells us our instructions is not to go out and save people or the evangelism. Your purpose is not to save people. God has already done that. He is saying, go, and, go to the harvest. And when you share the message to the harvest, that means those I have saved and don't, that don't know they saved yet, he says they will recognize it because I'm living within them. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says that a man who does not have God living in him cannot understand anything of the word of God. And the Bible says, how can he without me living in him. So he's looking for us to be on one accord, allowing the, 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 the harvest or those that are out there or outside of us see the love of God in us because then they will start recognizing and wanting to be a part and they will come. So what does he say to us? Go and make disciples. Go and teach. My job is to teach. Preaching is what's necessary to win the souls of the Lord Jesus Christ into the kingdom's work. Pastor's job is to teach and to equip. That's why we have to start learning what God has done with us and start recognizing that he has already prepared the unity in us. That's why it's so important that we recognize the commandments he's left us. Love God, love man, and embrace the fellowship. That's what brings unity within the body. The blessings and everything else that God has for the body is residing within the unity. The way that we enjoy it is when we come together. When we come together, we learn, we are equipped, we are blessed, we are blossomed, we are full of the Holy Spirit alive in us. And then when we go out, then we start evangelizing by letting people see the joy that's in our hearts, that Christ is alive in us. A oneness in the, in the covenant between us and God is what the unity is all about. We are in tune with God. We recognize him living in us. That's what the unity is all about. That, that's, that's what the communion table, that's what the Lord's table is all about, is for us to recognize our communion, our conversation, our love, our embracing, our recognizing that we recognize the fathership of God. We are a child of God. We commune with him. And so as we come to the table, we lift up the fact that his blood and his body is what blesses us to be his child.
it's not just, well, I come on first Sundays to eat a cracker and drink some juice. That is not what it's about. It is for you to remember what he did in our place. Keep that alive. Yeah, it's been over 2,000 years, but he wants us to keep that alive in our hearts. Recognize God did wonderful things for us by suffering for us, suffering the penalty of sin for us. Then we talk about the purity. We talked about the sovereignty, his power. We talked about the, 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 the unity of us bringing us together because of his sovereignty. Now he wants to talk about purity. Now he is not talking about sinless. If, if he's talking about sinlessness, then none of us can come to the table. None of us can come to the table. The statement when he says worthily, the word is, is an adverb. It's, 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 it is describing a verb. When he says worthily, he's not talking about us being worthy to come. We're not worthy to come. He's not talking about uh, modifying the noun, as you would say. He's not talking about us being worthy. The word there is worthily, which means that we are coming recognizing what the what what the what the wafer and the and and the juice represents and then we are in we are partaken in a worthy manner in other words we have asked him first of all to forgive us of our sins so that we come as 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 clean vessels jesus says if you confess your sins i'm faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. When that happens, we are pure. We come to the table then worthy to partake because we, become, we come as clean, pure vessels. That's what he means in the idea of purity and coming. Coming knowing that we don't even believe that he's the son of God, truly the son of God. We don't truly understand and believe that he's God in the flesh. Uh, we don't understand really why he even died for me. All, all, all these kinds of doubts in your mind and coming and have not confessed it is not coming to the table in purity. It's coming to the table with, 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 with rejection in your heart that he is truly who he says he is. But the flesh will never totally understand it. What God is talking about is the redeemed part of us that he's redeemed. Our soul believes. Our soul understands because it's been redeemed. And so when we come, we come with purity because of who we are. But he wants us to, to, to recognize in our hearts, in our minds, who he is. You cannot do better until you recognize what you're doing wrong or wrongly. You cannot. And so in recognizing what you do wrongly is saying that you're confessing that, hey, I'm wrong. The hardest thing for flesh to do is say I'm wrong. I'm, I'm telling you. There, there, there's some, you. You might say it for little tiny things, but to really sit down and say I'm wrong is a hard thing for flesh to do. And God knows that. But he says to us that if you come into your secret closets confessing to me, I'll fix it to where there's an humble heart that can result from that. And, and then you can move on and start to doing things that's better. When you confess your wrongness, your mind starts to hearing it. And if you're truly a child of God, and your mind keep hearing about how bad you are, sooner or later, your mind want to do something about it. That's how the flesh then starts to falling in line. But it has to start with our confession. The reason that a man that was horribly evil, I mean, not evil in a sense, because he did what God wanted to do, but, but a murderer he was, or he, he, he killed tens of thousands of people, and and even killed a man over the man's wife and got her pregnant and did all kinds of crazy things. But the reason that he was the apple of God's eye is because he was 
instantly confessing whenever God touched his heart and said, David, you're wrong. So God looks at each, each of us. He knows who we are. He made us. He knows how frail we are. He knows how in this flesh, how evil we are. And that's what makes life so miserable sometimes because the evilness in the flesh is so bad it fights against the purity in our spirit that is so holy. And it presents a battle that we struggle with day by day. But in this table that we come to, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, we recognize that God has taken care of that. We just have to learn to confess it in our hearts and embrace it because God is good. Brothers and sisters, God is alive in each one of us. He has perfected each one of us. We just have to realize it. We don't have to be the way that we are. We don't have to be as evil as we are. We don't have to be, you know, wanting to, to cut people away, want to, to, to move people out of the way. We want to destroy people. We want to see them suffer. We don't have to have that spirit in us because we are cleansed, people of purity because God has died for us and he's made it known to us and he tells us to come to the table and we will recognize that he died for us, that he shed his blood and his body was torn apart for each one of us. All he wants us to do is receive it and recognize that he's already done it for us. We don't have to be the way that we are, brothers and sisters. We do not. There's the, God's love just covers all of this. His grace is so abundant until there's no sin that can overdo it. The Bible says the more that you sin, the more of his grace that appears. You can't out our sin God's grace. We have a God that loves us so much, and all he wants us to do is recognize it. We cannot profess it until we learn that he did it. That's what recognizing it means. He truly did die for us. He truly did come into this world and he lived a sinless life so that he could be uh, 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 our propitiation, so that he could be the, the, the person worthy of taking on our sins. A sinless person could not have died to take our place. It had to be one that was without sin. It had to be a blameless lamb, a lamb without blemish. It had to be one that, that had never, ever sinned, never, ever disgraced God in any kind of way. And that's who Jesus was when he lived on this earth. He walked this word, earth. He had temptations in the same way that we do but he never sinned. He faced those temptations, but he always took the way out that the Father gave him in the same way that he do each one of us. We don't have to do the stuff we do. We don't have to sit back and say, the devil made me do it. The devil has no control over us. He don't even spiritually see us anymore because we all look like the Lord Jesus Christ in the spiritual realm according to who the Bible says. But he starts to recognizing us when we started doing the stuff we once did. Jesus has made a way to where we can walk in this life in the joy that he has prepared for us. Because he did die on Calvary's cross with our sins upon him. He was buried and for three days he was in the grave. But on the third day morning, my brothers and sisters, that's where the joy comes in. Because he was raised from the dead, which is proof positive that our sin was taken care of. That's the joy that we all rejoice in. That's the happiness that we have. And we should walk around with grins so big on our face until sometimes it looked like, I don't know, well, I ain't going to say that. But we should have such a joy in our life until it's not even describable. And we
we have access to that if we would yield to it. Because he did die and was buried and on the third day he was raised from the dead. The last part of the gospel is that he ascended back to the Father after 40 days and that he's coming again. He's coming again for us. And when he does, we will be in his presence for eternity. Never to be separated again. Never. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. I'm going to ask Reverend Fisher, as always. He is our evangelist, and I love the way that he renders a, an invitation. Glory to God. Did not our heart burn? Stand with me. Today, we heard the word of God spoken through our pastor. Right where you are, the only thing that you're required to do at this time those of you who do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, it's very, very simple. Just say, Lord, here I am I, a sinner, come into my life. Save me. I am a sinner. Just invite him into your heart. Recognize and confess that you need a savior. He didn't tell you to put anything down. He said just ask. Ask him and he'll come. Yeah. Open up your heart and he will come. You may be sitting and you may be thinking the things that I've done in my life, there's no way God can love me. There's no way God can forgive me for the things that I've done. I'm here to tell you, yes, he can. All of us are sinners saved by grace. All of us. Every last one of us had to say to God, come and save me a sinner. And it's just that simple. If you ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you a sinner, and you know that God is your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to sit down. You may be seated. Now, this second invitation is this. Yes, I've confessed Jesus as my Savior and Lord, but I want to know more about him. I want to know how I can live my life going forward now that I confess him but I don't have a church home let me share with you if you could come here we'll love you but you do have to go to a church somewhere to learn more about your Lord and Savior just make up your mind and go to a church and say I want to love I want to learn more about who Jesus is in my life. People, it's just that simple. It's just that simple. I can tell you from personal experience that Jesus will come where you are and all you have to do is just ask him. Bible say he stands at the door and knock. He's not going to come into your life until you invite him in. So invite him in. Learn of him. And he will save you. He will save you. He will save you. We thank you now. We thank those that have accepted Jesus Christ as a savior. The third invitation is this. You've been traveling, you've been gone for a while, and 
Maybe you want to come back and restore your membership. This is the invitation for you to come do that now. Oh, I've been wandering around. I've been going here and there. But I want to come back. I want to come back here because I know here I will be taught the word of God. I will learn who Jesus really is. And if that's you here today, you can come. You can come to choose this church, St. Joseph, as your home to learn more about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. as your personal Savior. And I pray that we have heard the word of God. We understand now that we need him. And he's available for us, all of us. No matter where you are, what situation you find yourself in, God is there. I stand now to worship God in our giving. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are so just grateful and thankful today, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty. We thank you, Lord, for the invitation to come into our lives and, and make us whole and to restore our hearts and mind, to renew our mind. God, we are so grateful and thankful for you, Lord. And now, Lord, we come to worship you in our giving. Bless us individually and collectively as we worship you in our giving. It is in Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen. Jesus, amen.
change the order. We had, now we want to have our announcements. Amen. Announcements, please. Thank you. Dear church family, may God bless you abundantly for your thoughtfulness during the home going of my brother. Much Christian love, our very own Sister Teresa Carey, District 2. Praise God. Great to see you, Sister Carey. All right, order, Lord. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we went over voting, but uh, the dates are out. May the 1st through the 14th, the times have changed, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. There are multiple ways to vote, but we do want to share that information with you. Okay, let's keep it going. Speaking of voting, St. Joseph offers free rides to the polls. That's what I'm talking about. That's a church family. Um, there is numbers to call. Um, uh, I believe I asked uh, Deacon Jones to put this on the board, but if not, it will be on the board. Do I need to read the numbers right now? Telephone numbers? No. Okay. I'll make sure if it's on the board. All right. Progressive Missionary, uh, Missionary Educational Baptist State Convention of Florida. It's the 50th an uh, annual session, Congress of Christian Education. This is held during July the 17th to the 21st of this year. Um, it is being held double tree by Hilton Hotel uh, at Universal Orlando. This is uh, Orlando, Florida. Uh, this information is on the board. Okay, information about the rooms, pricing, and what have you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to tear this up. So, can you tell me what I'm attempting to say? Hola. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Como esta? I attempted to say. Do you know what I attempted to say? Okay. Hello. How are you doing? Right? Okay. Why, you say? Because, guess what? St. Joseph Missionary Baptist Church is hosting a free summer camp for Spanish. What you say, uh-huh, uh-huh, Spanish. Yes. All right, it's a two-week camp, summer camp. It is for the ages of five-year-olds to ten-year-olds. All right, so if you have a baby, five to ten, this is a summer camp for you. Our pastor saw that it was fit to get our babies um, engaged in bilingual, you know, get them started. And to God be the glory, we, you know, as we train the child, it should go. Once they grow, it shall not, shall not depart from it. Well, let's get a foundation in that, too, because, hey, we need it, okay? So uh, the ages, again, is 5 to 10. Uh, it is very limited space. If you are serious about your 5 to 10-year-old, please, please, please get on top of it, okay? Because did I say it's free? Yes. <laughs> and if it's free, it's for me. I don't know about y'all. Okay. The, the dates are, it's going to be held here at St. Joseph. The dates are June the 5th to, uh, throughout June 16th. June 5th, June 16th. Monday through Fridays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay? Was I clear on that? All right. Two weeks, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. All right. There is more information, and it also is already <coughs> on the board, Lord's Will, because I asked Deacon Jones to put it up there. Okay, all righty. These church programs are the best things since like we haven't done that in so long, right? Okay. Well, the information is on the back. <laughs> yes, there is information on the back. Reminder. So I'm not going to talk us to death because we have more important things to do. But these things are important. Okay. We're talking about this is the last weekend that I have to um, announce the Mother's Day brunch. All right. Now I screenshot it so I can read it. All right, y'all, give me a second. Pull 
it together, Andrea. All right, this is the last day to um, reach out. Ladies of St. Joseph Missionary Baptist Church, Mother's Day, brunch and games, prizes and fun. Yeah, I read that right. Unfortunately, um, we are not going to show a movie. But please, 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 please don't um, fret. There are so many different things that are, has come available. The brunch is still being held, but there are so many fun, fun, interactive, loving things to be done. So let me continue to read. As we know, it is next Saturday the 13th at 1030 a.m. in our cafeteria. To all the ladies and girls of St. Joseph Missionary Baptist Churches, ages 1 to 95 and more, thank you for your participation. We are happy and excited to announce that we have 88 ladies. Okay, 88 ladies committed to coming to the Mother's Day brunch. Isn't that a blessing? Yes. Praise God. Okay. Um, we are looking forward to each of you joining us for a wonderful day of fun and fellowship as we celebrate each other for Mother's Day. We have, um, we have an update. Initially, we committed, um, communicated, excuse me, that we would enjoy a scrumptious brunch and a great movie afterwards, right? I already spoke on that. However, due to some difficulties, we are not able to show a movie. That's okay. But do not despair. We have planned a fun-filled day that we know you will um, enjoy. So, St. Joseph's ladies um, and girls, we are looking forward to seeing you Saturday morning on the 13th for a day of food, fun, and fellowship. Remember, it is a Mother's Day brunch. Now, with that said, there are no dress requirements. There are none. However, we do ask if you are coming to the brunch that, you know, maybe not jeans and a sweatshirt, but do your lady Saturday best, whatever that is. Be comfortable, but yet, ladies, you know, maybe spring dresses, put a little bow on your head, hat, you know, just feel good. Just feel good, ladies, because this is what it's about, okay? So just do your best, and whatever that is, feeling good, ladylike. So there are going to be some hats, there are going to be some summer dresses, some little uh, sandals, but whatever it is that you desire, I just want to get that across. There's not a requirement. However, we are trying to set a, set a mood, set a, you know, that's it. I'm going to leave that alone. So also, you have the dates on the back for the um, anniversary. That is important. The information is here. But we, if you have not, we do have the assessment fee of $125 for each adult. Just want to remind you. So if I forgot for anything at this time, Lord bless me in it. All right, that concludes the announcements for today. I hope I ain't shamed nobody, but love you. Thank you. Amen. I just want to add, want to add just one uh, thing to that as, as, as the, uh, the Spanish. After the presentation and everything, and after looking at all the facts that was presented, and, you know, there are 20 Spanish-speaking countries in the world that, that, where that's their first language. Uh, this country, their first speaking language is English, but we are number two as far as the number of people in the country that speak Spanish. Number two out of 20, that's their number one language. That, that, what that says, that it's going to get to the point to where our small little children are going to be challenged in employment in, in, because of being, you know, so many people that speak the language. So the whole idea is to get our youth uh, uh, ready, you know, to get that into their hearts, their minds. You know, we're not going to be able to have them speak in fluent Spanish in two weeks. Uh, although from what I've seen from the work of children, uh, they, they, it surprised me how well they pick it up and how fast they pick it up. But that's the intent. And I pray that any, anybody, any of us that have children that age, please uh, uh, sign up to be a part of that because it's, it's, it's quite critical. Uh, one other thing that I'm going to sit down. Uh, the movie is mine. It, 
it, it is so hard to find movies that are made that you can present in the church and, and not feel guilty <laughs> about what's saying. I mean, I, you know, and I don't apologize for that because that's the world system messing everything up. You know, I'm finding even Christian movies, sometimes in the, there are parts in there that you just like, Lord have mercy. You know, the world system feel they have to do that, you know, but we don't have to be a part of that, you know. So, you know, th that's th th don't, don't get upset with Sister Smith or any of the others that are working on this, because I, I was the one that said that I, the ones that I saw, I, it, it, no, uh-uh. As a matter of fact, I spent out of my pocket and bought the, the movies myself to look at it, and I had to turn it off because I was looking at it in the church and finished looking at it at home because it was so, you know, so it, that's a pastoral decision, okay? But there's so much else that's left in the program that I encourage all of you to, to be a part of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. That's all that I... church, uh, real quick, because I know we got communion, um, Lord's Supper, I'm sorry, Lord's Supper, I stand corrected, uh, just real quick, just want to uh, let everybody know that I make the church schedule to open and close on Wednesday and Sundays, so if you need access to the church on a weekday or on a Saturday, we have a sign-in sheet, I updated the sign-in sheet, it's on the back bulletin board. Please put down the ministry, um, a contact person, and let us know what day of the week that you need access to the church. Two things that we ask. Okay, one is that if you put 9 o'clock to 10.30, <laughs> we expect 9 o'clock to 10.30 because we have things we have to do also. Uh, the second thing is, say, for instance, the youth ministry is going to be up here from 9 to 10.30, and the ushers want to meet. We ask that you try to coordinate it at the same time. You don't, this is a big church. You can do a lot at one time. So you don't have to wait until one ministry leaves before you come in, okay? Uh, if you have any questions about getting access to the church, you can contact me or you can contact the church office. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Dick. Uh, hospitality ministry. Giving honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Pastor Gregory, pulpit members and friends. Good afternoon. Good My afternoon. name is Sister Simon, and this is Deborah, Sister Thompson. At this time, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our visitors. Are there any visitors visiting with us today? Would you please stand and give us your name and church affiliation? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the pastor and the St. Joseph family, we would like to thank you for worshiping with us today. You have been a blessing. Uh, and we would like for you to remember that this is the church where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord, ever so in Black Bottom. Thank you. St. Joseph, I'd like to leave you with this thought. You think sanitizers and bleach work good? <laughs> you should see what the blood of oh, Jesus my, can my, clean my. up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this is a tough one. Thing, so. <laughs> oh, bless the name of Jesus. How are we feeling so far? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask if you're able to stand to stand. We're going to repeat our church covenant. We do this every first Sunday. And it's just a reminder that there's some accountability in our action and conduct, that we are accountable for one another. 
with our actions and conduct. It's just a reminder. Amen? Amen. Repeat after me. Having been led as we believe, as we believe. By, the of God, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We do now in the presence of God, angels and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain it in worship, ordinance, discipline, and doctoring, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindreds, and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagement, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, bite-biting, and excessive anger, to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating drink as a beverage and to be zealous in our effort to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in our prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feelings and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, and mindful of the rules of our Savior, to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principle of God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Ordained ministers. Ordained deacons. We do come to this table celebrating the Lord's Supper. In that, as the scriptures have warned us, that we should be confessing our sins, allowing God to cleanse us so that we can come celebrate the Lord's Supper in a worthy state. God said that he sent his son into this world to die for our sins and he demonstrated that starting in the Garden of Gethsemane into the Lord's 
dinner, the Lord's supper that he had in the upper room to demonstrate to the disciples what was going to happen in the following days. During that time, after the, the celebration or the, the supper of the Passover, which was for the Jews for times past in the exile, there were elements still left from the dinner on the table. And as always, Jesus took whatever that was present to teach what he was trying to teach his people. So on the table, as he looked according to the scripture, was the bread that was left. And the Bible said he took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it, showing that his body would be broken. And then he handed it to his disciples and he told them to eat ye all of it, for this represents my body that will be broken for you. And then, according to the scriptures, as he looked around and he saw the cup that was from the Passover dinner, and he poured into that cup the fruit of the vine, the wine that they were drinking with the celebration of the Passover. And he said to his disciples, Brothers, this is my blood that will be shed for you for the remission of your sins. And in like man manner, the Bible said he prayed and blessed it, and he handed it to his disciples, and he told them to drink ye all of it. And then his finished statement was that, as often as you do this, you show remembrance of what I'm about to do for you on the cross of Calvary. Now, we can't bless like he did on that, that day. God, I'm sure Jesus was praying to his Father in a way that if we could have heard it would have been phenomenal, best words to use. But we're going to ask that Reverend Fisher take us to the throne, and we began by asking God to bless each of us as we have confessed our sins and bless the elements. Eternal Father, it is with thanksgiving in our hearts and praises on our tongue as we come to sit at your table. Father, we also ask that you will bless the elements that is used to represent your body, your blood. Protect us, Lord. Forgive us. Strengthen us. And in your word, you say, as often as we do this, we do show forth your death until you come again. So, Lord, we come in unity. We come in one accord. Thank you, Lord, for inviting us to the table. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your mind on Calvary's cross. Jesus chose not to come off the cross. My sins, your sins. He died. Truly, it should have been us. But thank God Jesus said, send me.
that cross, he did not say a mumbling word. Can you hear the nails going into his body? Can you envision the spear in his side? anyone been omitted? If so, please raise your hand. Elements, please. Again, on the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it, then he broke it. He said, this bread represents my body that will be broken for you on Calvary cross. In remembrance of me, eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup. The cup represented his blood that would be shed for you on Calvary Cross. Jesus said, in remembrance of me, drink.
was the blood. Yes, it was the blood. Yeah. I just want to say, Deacon Essence, y'all look so good in your white. I thank y'all for all the work you're doing with the ladies in the church. You're doing a wonderful job. Keep it up. Everybody is doing a phenomenal job. Amen. Now, on that night that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, part of the celebration is that he sung a hymn. We don't know what that hymn is. Good thing that we don't. But here at St. Joseph, we celebrate and sing in Jesus, keep me near the cross. And Pastor Rim used to say, let's sing it with gusto and, and with excitement as with we truly know that he delivered us and saved us from that cross. So let us sing together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Near the cross. church in our hearts. You have blessed us with the joy of us knowing that you died for us on that cross and that through your Lord's Supper that you keep us in remembrance of what you did for us. Thank you for that message. Thank you for the joy of knowing that. And now as we look to you for our benediction, Unto him who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, it is to he that we bless and we praise and we glorify, looking to keep us protected until we are together again as a family of St. Joseph. Bless the fellowship. Bless each of us so that we will know and learn to love you love each other, and embrace the fellowship. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name, and all of us shall say together. Amen.